touches all the rest of it. Okay, so this, uh, this briefing, as you'll see up on the title slide, uh, is uh, in cooperation with nature. Uh, what I mean by that is that two of the papers that are being presented here uh, have just appeared in nature just this afternoon. Uh, and I appreciate Leslie Sage and his team at nature working with us to coordinate so that we could have the briefings on the same day that the papers appeared online. Um, so those are the papers by uh, Dr. Bodowitz and uh, Dr. Smith. We are covering everything in the universe today, from comets in our own solar system all the way out to the most distant, earliest galaxies. Um, we're going to have uh, five presentations. First will be a rapid decrease in the rotation rate of Comet 41P Tuttle Jacobini Cressac from Dennis Bodowitz of the University of Maryland. And he's going to be followed by a very brief presentation from Paul Hertz at NASA headquarters, director of their astrophysics division. Uh, it's related to Dr. Bodowitz's presentation, and that's all I will say about it at this point. Then we're going to switch to some ground-based astronomy. Green Bank Telescope detects hydrogen clouds in the Fermi bubble wind. If you don't know what the Fermi bubble wind is, you will soon find out. That's be going to be presented by Jay Lockman of Green Bank Observatory. Then Christopher Russell from the Instituto de Astrophysica at the Pontific, I'm not going to try it, in Chile, is a Catholic University in Chile, 360 degree video, an immersive visualization of the galactic center. And finally, we'll move out to distant galaxies with ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, sees galaxies only 800 million years after the Big Bang, and that will be presented by Renska Smith from the University of Cambridge, England. And with that, I will turn it over to Dennis Bodowitz. All right, thank you for, for being here and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, um, to talk to you here today. Um, I will talk about observations acquired with the SWIFT satellite uh, of a small comet named 41P Total Giacomini Krasak. This comet passed Earth really closely in April 2017, 0.14 AU, and is there uh, with that in the top 20 of closest comets in modern times. Um, what was important about this comet is that it was observable for a very long time. It was very bright. Um, we can observe it for months from the northern hemisphere. Um, and, and as it was very bright, we could use many different techniques to study. So for us, we call this a very good apparition. Um, the comet's been known for a while, 1858, uh, and it orbits the sun every 5.4 years. And we call it lovingly TGK, just for short. Um, when we first observed this comet in March of 2017 from the ground using the Discovery Channel telescope, which is an image uh, here, it's a 4.3 meter class telescope in, in Arizona, we used a, a technique that, that we often do in comet science, which are narrowband technique, narrowband images, and those are filters that are centered on the brightest emission lines in, in comets. Uh, and what we saw with those filters is uh, two jets that were rotating, and you can see that in the, in the six images here, and we found that they were repeating at about every 20 hours, um, indicating a rotation of the comet. We had also scheduled observations with SWIFT to also look at its rotation period. Uh, when we scheduled those observations, we, we did not know yet what the uh, rotation period of the comet was. So what we did is, and that's a bit of a technical diagram that I'm showing here, we came up with an observing technique that on the one hand would use as little observing time as possible, but on the other hand would allow for a very broad range of rotation periods of the comet. Uh, as, as you may know, you can't just ask for, for two weeks of, of uninterrupted space telescope time, so um, you need to come up with a plan. So one of the problems that, that there is with uh, observing cometary rotation periods is that the rotation periods are very similar to that of Earth, so of order of a couple of hours to typically 40 hours, which is one of the longer ones. Um, so often, day-night aliasing is a big problem. And to avoid aliasing, what we did is we, 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 we defined here um, 12 hours ob observing, then we would not look at it for six hours, again 12 hours, then not look at it for nine hours just to break that repetition, and then again for, for another 12 hours. And what we thought is that, well, since we don't know what the rotation period is, anywhere between six or 40 hours at least, 
we will get a couple of repetitions of the rotation, and uh, that's what the different colors indicate here. Yellow means that we, we, we'd observe a rotation once or part of a light curve. Blue means we, 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 where, where you can see that the very short rotation, we'd get eight times uh, the same rotation. So with this plan, we set to observe the comet in, uh, between May 6 and 9 of 2017. And what we found is, is a light curve. We measured a light curve near the nucleus of the comet, and we found that it now it rotated between 46 and 60 hours, so no longer the 20 hours that were observed in March. The images here, what I show is um, uh, on, the, on the left is a, is a V-band image of comet 41P, uh, as I've seen by, by Swift UVOT, and you see that it's, um, it's a very extended object, very large uh, dusty coma around it with a lot of stars in the background, and we extracted the light from the little yellow circle centered on the nucleus. Um, that light, the amount of light, repeated, uh, and we looked at, at, at when it repeated by shifting um, parts of the light curve. So the yellow triangles that you see here is, um, are, are the same as the ones that are, that are listed between 9 and 10 uh, of May. So that's the part that's repeating where it is going up again. Now, as you see, we found a range between 46 and 60 hours. And the fact that, that we were able to do that more precise is that while we were planning these long-term observations, the brightness of the comets also changed as it was going away from the sun. That relation is, is not exactly known. Um, but you can imagine what that does to the yellow points are going to shift up, and that would mean uh, a different um, uh, repetition period. So the reasonable range in period is 46 and 60 hours, and that is definitely very different from the first measurements. So over time, uh, what you see here is a plot of the um, um, time, days relative to perihelion. Perihelion is the, the time when it comes as close to the sun, and the rotation periods. And the two yellow dots, or orange dots, indicate our observations. Again, 20 hours to over four, uh, 46 hours. And in between, you see two points measured by the Lowell uh, telescopes. Those were announced also at the, the DPS meeting um, uh, in 2017. So, so the largest, but also the fastest change that has ever been seen in comet rotation, uh, this change occurred in only two months. Now, of course, the interesting question is why, why did this happen? So um, Comet 41P is a very small comet. It's, it's just about a mile in size, we think. We don't know that exactly. The second thing is we also know that it's very active. So these two, two things can help to change the rotation peri period very, sim very easily. Um, how comet rotation periods work is uh, shown in this, this diagram, also from Nature, uh, by, in an article by, by Jessica Agarwal, um, where you see that, that gas jets are pushing the, the comet um, around and, and can change its rotation. Um, now, it's a small comet, very active, but this is not unique to Comet 41P. For example, Comet Hartley 2, shown here um, in, in an image from Epoxy, the space mission, <clears throat> has the same properties. It's also relatively small, about the same size, and also it produces a lot of water. So why does 41P then change so quickly, but Hartley 2 didn't? And the answer of that is shown in, in the third image there. I hope you can see that. What we found around Hartley 2 is an enormous cloud of, of icy particles. So that implies that <clears throat> although Hartley 2 is producing a lot of gas, this doesn't come from the nucleus directly, but it's produced in the, in the, nu in the coma, in the, in the gas cloud, and therefore it cannot um, exert any torques on the nucleus because the, the dust is lifted by gas. Um, so what 41P is, 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 um, is different in that all the gas is directly coming from the nucleus, it can help. And also, um, and a second point is that if you look again at the, at the top image of Hartley 2, you can see that the bright end is where all the jets are coming off, and these are exactly along the rotation axis. So instead of pushing the comet around, it's not exerting any force on it. So 41P also has to have very efficient torquing jets. Now then, of course, the question is, what did this, did this comet do in, in, the, in the past, and, and what does it do in the future? Um, <clears throat> this comet cannot be in a stable, stable state. What happens if, if, you, if you slow down rotation a lot is that it becomes easier and easier to completely change the rotation of a comet. Think of like a, a top. Uh, at the end, when the top no longer has a gyroscopic effect, but it's, it's, it's rotating very slowly, it starts to wobble because small um, other effects can easily change it. And that's exactly what's, what we think is going to happen with this comet. Um, some, at this moment, it may already have a rotation period less than 100 hours. Uh, it can start to wobble, it can start to, to, to flip around. 
What is also interesting, if you go back in time, um, and you see that in this line here, going into the red zone, when comets spin faster than about five hours, they risk uh, breaking up uh, because the, 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 the forces on it are stronger than the coherent forces. And interestingly, in 2001, exactly when we're dipping in the red here, this comet had two enormous outbursts that were seen from, from the ground. And those may very well be related to, to these effects. One problem there is, is a, as, I, as I call it here, a chicken or egg problem. Um, did those outbursts now create the active regions that now cre um, cause the behavior that we see here? Or was it already, an, um, uh, was it the rotation that, that caused the outburst? So which, which way did this go? In my last slide, I will summarize again the, the findings here. I'll leave that up for you. And um, I also give you my contact details. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Paul Hertz. Uh, I'm the director of astrophysics at NASA. So we just heard about one, uh, an exciting new discovery that was made possible by observations obtained with the SWIFT spacecraft. And it's one of thousands of discoveries that SWIFT has made in the 13 years since it was launched in 2004. In February of this year, of this past year, NASA and the science community lost one of its most eminent scientists, Dr. Neil Gerrels, who was the principal investigator of the SWIFT mission. Today, I'm very pleased to announce that NASA is renaming the SWIFT Observatory to be the Neil Gerrels SWIFT Observatory. During his nap... Let me just make a few comments about Neil. Uh, during his NASA career, Neil wore many hats in service to the astrophysics community. He served as the chief of the Astroparticles Laboratory at Goddard Space Flight Center. He served as project scientist roles on the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, which was one of NASA's four great observatories, and its successor, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. Most recently, he served as the project scientist for WFIRST, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, which will be NASA's next large space telescope following the James Webb Space Telescope. But Neil was best known for his role as the principal investigator of the SWIFT mission. Launched in 2004, SWIFT's two-year mission was to solve the mystery of gamma ray bursts, and the mission was spectacularly successful. The SWIFT observations were critical in understanding the progenitors of the birth of the bursts and of the two known classes of gamma ray bursts. SWIFT confirmed that the long gamma ray bursts represented the birth cries of a black hole from the collapse of a massive star. And SWIFT, for the first time, pinpointed the location of short gamma ray bursts, which were recently confirmed to be merging neutron stars through the detection of their gravitational waves. In the years since its prime mission ended, SWIFT has been used by the science community as the go-to facility for transient and variable cosmic phenomena of all kinds. And unlike most NASA wish missions, SWIFT is not an acronym. Rather, it's a reflection of the telescope's unique ability to rapidly repoint, autonomously repoint, and uniquely obtain X-ray and ultraviolet images within hours of an alert. Neil's vision and leadership were critical in ushering in the new era of time domain astronomy. And for this accomplishment, Neil was posthumously recognized with the Dan David Prize in 2017. And that's why today at NASA's town hall, and then again right now, uh, NASA is very pleased to announce that the NASA SWIFT satellite has been renamed the Neil Garrell SWIFT Observatory. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jay Lockman from the Green Bank Observatory, and I'm here to talk to some, about some developments in our understanding of the Fermi bubbles. Now, over the past 15 years or so, astronomers have come to realize that there are two very large regions of extremely hot gas 
coming up out of the Milky Way galaxy. And these are shown here in an artist's conception against a photograph of the Milky Way. Viewed from above, the Fermi bubbles occupy a space that's about the size of this dashed line here where the star is, uh, shows the position of the sun. So they're very large scale features. Now the artist's conception is really very pretty, but we shouldn't uh, let uh, be misunderstood that the reality looks anything quite like that. Here's the data from the Fermi satellite, and show, it's these uh, very convincing figures, especially the one on the upper right, that uh, made people realize there really was something going on. And yet, you see, and so it's named after the Fermi satellite that produced these images in different wave bands, but you see there's really a lot of uncertainty about the properties of the bubble, especially where it comes into the galactic plane. There's two general uh, expectations for the origin of bubbles like this, and one is that it has something to do with the black hole at the center of the galaxy. But the center of the Milky Way is also the site of a lot of star formation and supernova remnants. So these bubbles of very hot expanding gas could be driven either by black hole activity or supernova remnants. We really don't know very much about them. They're extraordinarily weak, and there's nothing in the hot wind that we can use to trace their velocity. They've had an effect on the interstellar medium of the galaxy. And in the upper right, I show the, the artist's conception with a uh, box around it. And the, uh, the main part of the slide shows what the neutral hydrogen, as traced in the 21 centimeter radio line, looks like over this field. And you can see that toward the edges, outside the Fermi bubble, we have a thick, rich hydrogen layer. But once we get into the Fermi bubble, all that's gone. It appears that the bubble has really blown a hole in the overall interstellar medium of the galaxy. Well, a few years ago, a colleague of mine, Naomi McClure Griffiths, at the Australian National University, used the Australian Telescope Compact Array to survey a region around the center of the galaxy in neutral hydrogen emission in the 21 centimeter radio line. And she looked in this region that's outlined by the red box. Now to show you where that is on the map from the Fermi satellite, it's down in there, right at the base of the bubble. And what she, what she and others, and I was part of this, found, in addition to the main hydrogen layer, were these little hydrogen clouds that seemed to be detached from everything else that was going on. And this is very exciting, because just like the wind on Earth is not something you can see, but if you take a handful of dust and toss it up, then you can trace the velocity and direction of the wind on Earth. And our hope was that these little hydrogen clouds would also be trace particles for the larger evolution of these bubbles. And so we went to the Green Bank Telescope and surveyed the regions shown in the blue box. And I show it there in comparison to the, uh, the red area that was surveyed from Australia. We had 20 times more sensitivity and a much larger area, and we were further up in the Fermi bubble wind where we really hoped we could pin down some properties. Well, we found over 100 hydrogen clouds that seemed to be associated with the Fermi bubble. The red boxes here show the rough outlines of the survey region, but each dot here is a new cloud we've discovered, and it's color-coded by velocity. And if you look at the velocity scale, these things go from about minus 300 to over plus 300 kilometers a second, a huge range in velocity for these clouds. You can also see that while there's some gaps in the distribution, they pretty much fill the region that we observed. I want to just blow up one little section of this to show you how puzzling this is. Because you look in the upper left, there are two clouds that are right next to each other on the sky, and one is going away from us, redshifted at 300 kilometers a second, and the other is coming toward us at 300 kilometers a second. There's nothing else like this dispersion of velocities anywhere else in the Milky Way. Well, we've modeled it as a cone of outflowing clouds with only two parameters the angle of the cone, and the velocity of the clouds. And we can fit all the data with this simple model. And so we really do believe that we have found a population of clouds entrained in the Fermi bubble wind that allows us to get some good insight into its origin, its energetics, and its structure. And so this is the artist's conception based on the Fermi data of the Fermi bubble, and we now have replaced it with a new artist's conception of all this very hot gas entraining these small hydrogen clouds. 
And I'll just end by talking about the properties. There's about a million solar masses of hydrogen in the clouds we've detected. Um, velocity expansion, 330 kilometers a second. The winds lasted about 10 million years. In other words, to get the clouds as high as we see at 330 kilometers a second takes about 10 million years. And the expansion energy, we can just calculate the kinetic energy in the clouds, and it, it's large but can be provided by known supernovae. But there are some puzzles. Why do the clouds live so long? Models of clouds entrained in hot gas have them evaporating long before 10 million years. How far up do the clouds extend? They go as far away as we've looked, so we don't know the answer. At some point, they have to evaporate. They have to become ionized. And finally, what in detail do the clouds tell us about the wind? Thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Christopher Russell. I'm a postdoc at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Um, it's my pleasure to um, speak to you today about some visualization work I've done. Um, but first, I very much want to thank the, uh, the Chandra Press Office for giving me this, um, this opportunity. So first, uh, let's talk about the uh, Chandra observations of the Galactic Center, um, uh, work that was done prior to this uh, particular release. Um, so with Chandra's excellent spatial resolution, you can easily resolve many structures in x-rays in the center of the galaxy. That is not possible with other um, x-ray telescopes. So you can see the point sources here, Sagittarius A star, that is our galaxy's supermassive black hole, uh, four million suns. Um, and you can see the diffuse emission in between. So for um, the purposes of what I'm interested in, I care mostly about this diffuse emission. So again, if we didn't have Chandra, we wouldn't be able to resolve this. So I'll get into the models um, in the, the subsequent slides, but just to show what we use Chandra for, um, you have the X-ray observation in the center, um, and I'm interested in the region that is in between these two circles. Um, so not Sagittarius A star itself, but its surrounding region. And on the left and on the right, there are two different models, and again, in the next slide, I'll, I'll tell you the difference between the two. But you can see that the X-ray properties uh, depend very significantly um, on what goes into the model. So if we, um, we do a model, the, compute the X-ray emission, tweak the model, compute the X-ray emission, et cetera, until you find one that matches um, the result of Chandra. So there's the, uh, the connection. So now let's talk about the, the, the models and then what we make the 360 degree video from. Um, so as you can imagine, the dominant feature would be the supermassive black hole, um, but you will not find it on this plot. Um, that is because I have placed you, the viewer of the video, as uh, Sagittarius A star. Um, so you had a very uh, a, a very um, a good holiday season. You just gained uh, four million solar masses. Um, <laughs> and then you now have stars that are orbiting you. Um, those are the white twinkling objects that it's not gonna twinkle in the still, but in the video you will see them. Then you go to the left, you can see some of these slow winds. They make this really cool clump structure. And that's the visual appeal of uh, viewing this um, simulation in this, uh, in this fashion. Um, you can, some of these clumps where I have labeled older clumps, they are then uh, spiraling in, so they're coming directly towards you. Um, and the coolest ones are the ones that tidally stretch. So if you look on the right side of the plot, this particular clump, the, the yellow is moving uh, up, and it's getting stretched in that, uh, in that direction. Um, you also have some unclumped gas from the fast winds. It looks nice and smooth, um, unfortunately not as visually appealing. So what I'm gonna show in the movie, there's five different elements. So we're gonna take a quick trip. Uh, we're gonna zoom into the simulation. Then I'm gonna show the no outburst simulation. So what that means is that Sagittarius A star is in a calm state and is not ejecting um, any material. Then we're gonna rewind. Uh, we're gonna do another one with the outburst. Um, this time you're gonna see the outburst effect on the clumps. It basically drives, uh, it, it diminishes the accretion significantly. And then we're finally gonna come back to Earth. So here is the video, uh, here's the zoom in, and poof, now we're at uh, Sagittarius A star, and hopefully you can, um, you can see the video with the, uh, the TV lights. So you can see the stars um, are, are, are twinkling around. Um, the the uh, color is the column density. Oh, that's not good. Oops. 
Let's try that again. Okay, thanks. I was more worried about the uh, the video pausing. Okay. Uh, yeah, it worked in the the practice. Well, so this is good opportunity for everybody to come look at the video in the actual goggles, <laughs> because it's not showing up here. Let's try one more time. And if it doesn't work, I can just skip to the next uh, the next part. There, that looks better. So there, you can see the clumps. It seems like it's working now. There's clumps going around. Um, when the, the, the clump will disappear, that just means it, it crosses the inner boundary of the simulation and could be accreted. So it's going to disappear now. Um, and then the, the coolest thing, which I hope the video doesn't free, pause before it. Uh, so this is the clump that gets tidally stretched. So you can watch it go. And I'm just whizzing my head around as it goes. It, it becomes nice and elongated. And then you get some extra dramatic effects by it skipping. And then. Let's jump to here. Let's see if that'll work. Okay, so now we're doing a simulation with the outburst. And so you're gonna see a haze. The, the haze in front, this is material coming off um, the inner boundary of the simulation, which is to simulate an outflow from Sagittarius A star. And notice all the accretion, all the clumps that made the first part look cool, they're all gone. So the simulation just ended and you can see that there's uh, much less material left over because the video is a lot darker. So what that shows is that the, um, the, the first sim I did, the outburst, and this one behave uh, very differently. Hence, you see the difference in the x-rays. And now we zoom out, and now we're back. OK, no more video, so no more video issues. Um, it, since that was me uh, with the goggles on my head, um, it's much better if you can actually experience that yourself. Um, it, it just looks much, much cooler than just watching a, a, a jittery video. So if you have an Android uh, phone, the easiest thing you can do is just go to the QR code on the left um, because of the Android, Google, YouTube connection. Um, otherwise, I would suggest just opening the YouTube app if you have it. Um, you have to do YouTube because that's where we put the video and that enables the 360 degree warping. Um, so if you go to the Chandra X-ray site and then you're looking for this video here, 360 degree video, an immersive visualization of the Galactic Center. Um, or as the last thing that I put on my Twitter feed, um, if that's easier for you to get there. Um, so while hopefully that is working for folks, um, again, if the, if the Wi-Fi is too taxed, then that's good um, advertisement for me, everybody to come look at the goggles. Um, but I, it, it is much more immersive when you actually put the, the VR goggles on, and you, so you can look all around, you can look up, you can look down, left, right. Uh, it, it, it's, it's quite a different experience. I have five sets with me. Um, I've been accumulating them ever since I started doing this work. Um, so if you're all interested, I'll be around afterwards. Um, they're, they're queued up and you can easily see what it, what it looks like. Um, it definitely looks the best in, the, uh, in this type here, um, the, the, the Samsung ones. It, it com makes it completely dark so you feel completely immersed in the, uh, the simulation. All right, so hopefully that worked for some folks. Um, just a, a couple of acknowledgements. Um, the, the top group, just to allow this work to, uh, to happen. Um, the, the middle group was the funding that I had um, while I was doing this um, at the NASA Postdoc program and now in, now in Chile. And uh, again, a big thank you to uh, the, the Chandra Press folks for allowing me to, to do this. So thank you. Hi all, um, my name is Renske Smit and I'm here from the University of Cambridge in the UK uh, and I'm very pleased to talk to you today about some recent results that are being published in Nature this week. So what we've seen in short, um, we've seen the motion of gas in, gal in very early galaxies for the first time and it's this motion, whirlpool mo motion, that you see here illustrated by an artist's impression. So looking back in time. Um, what you see here is the timeline of the universe. The Big Bang's on the left, the modern day galaxies are on the right. And what we know about the early universe is that the first few hundred million years of cosmic time, the universe is dark, in the so-called dark ages. And then sometime in the first billion years of cosmic time, the first stars and the first galaxies emerge. And the radiation from these first galaxies um, ionizes the hydrogen, the neutral hydrogen that pervades the early universe. And that's why we sometimes call this the epoch of reionization. 
So when we want to see the galaxies inside this very early epoch, we have to peer very, very deep into the universe with telescopes. And we try to identify galaxies whose light has traveled almost 13 billion years to get to us. While this light travels through the universe, the universe expands and the light reddens. And it's this reddening of the light that we use to um, identify that these galaxies are indeed that far away from us, that they've traveled th that far to get to us. However, we have one problem. Um, the most important tracer uh, that we can see with optical telescopes is partly obscured by this neutral hydrogen in the early universe. So one thing we can do is go to a different wavelength range where you are not bothered by this neutral hydrogen haze. And so we can go to the submillimeter where there's another tracer that we can look at. And so ALMA, which is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, it's the most powerful submillimeter uh, telescope in the world. When it came to its full power in 2013, it provided us with a new opportunity to look at the very first galaxies um, in a different way and uh, identify these galaxies. So that is what we have done. We started with um, imaging from the Hubble and Spitzer Space Telescope to identify candidate galaxies that might be that early. And we picked two galaxies that we then further studied with ALMA. You see those in the inset panels. And so what we've seen with ALMA is this spectrum that you see the, in the bottom figure. And so we see a transition of ionized carbon, and it's the frequency of this transition that tells us that these galaxies have been traveling, that the light from these galaxies has been traveling 12.9 billion years. So with other words, we see these galaxies 800 million years after the Big Bang. That's 6% of the current age of the universe. So this is the first time we've been able to do this, to identify galaxies in this early epoch, not with an optical telescope, but with a submillimeter telescope. Um, but ALMA cannot only do the identification. You might wonder why there's this beautiful rainbow of colors in these galaxies. So let me explain that. Um, when we get, ALMA does not just provide us with one spectrum, but in every position of the galaxy, we can see a spectrum. So we see this transition of ionized carbon in every pixel of the figure on the right. And so uh, the small frequency shifts of this transition tells us that there's movement in the gas. Uh, and what you can see with the colors is that on one hand of the on the one side of the galaxy, the gas is moving towards us, and on our side it's moving away from us. So that gives us this impression of a rotation around a cent central point. So that's very similar really to galaxies that we see much later in our own uh, Milky Way. We have is a, is a dis rotating disk galaxy. Um, however, we did not expect to see exactly the same thing as what we see in the Milky Way in this early universe. The reason for that is, um, I'll try to explain here, you see a movie of a, gal of a uh, disk galaxy forming, and we know that the early universe is very turbulent, and you can see in the movie what kind of environment these galaxies live in. There's a lot of gas streaming into galaxies, but also there's a lot of young stars present. These young stars explode as supernovae. And as these supernovae explode, they can expel gas from galaxies. And so these effects cause us to believe that most early uh, galaxies will likely be turbulent, will be very chaotic in their motions. So it was a surprise to then see this very regular rotating pattern in these galaxies. So what we know about these galaxies is that um, when these supernovas go off, they're able to retain the gas. They don't lose it. We know that as new gas streams in, um, the rotating motion of the gas is not disturbed. The chaotic motion is not dominating. And so this gives us an impression that these galaxies are already very mature for, such, um, for galaxies in such an early epoch. So that leads us to conclude that it must be that at least some galaxies in the early universe right after they are born, start to evolve very, very rapidly to reach this very early maturity. So that's uh, a summary of what we've seen. Um, so we've identified two galaxies 800 million years after the Big Bang. Um, we made the first measurement of gas motions in these galaxies. Um, and so we know what we've learned is that at least some galaxies in the early universe can already form rotating disks, just like the Milky Way. And while these are only two galaxies, it's the you know, uh, first time we've been able to do this, we know that at least some galaxies in the early universe must evolve very rapidly. So I'll leave you with my contact details on the bottom, and thank you.
Thank you all very much. So we'll go to the Q&A now. Uh, Larry, my uh, Deputy Press Officer Larry Marshall has the roving mic, so if you have a question, raise your hand and we'll uh, and wait for the mic, and then identify yourself and tell us who you write for. And then uh, Carrie is uh, collecting questions on the webcast. We'll go to her after a few minutes. So we have some questions here in the room? Okay, we'll start with Monica. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Monica Young with Sky and Telescope. Sorry, I'm finding a cold. Um, these questions are for uh, Dr. Smith. I was wondering if you could tell us um, what the resolution is of ALMA on these galaxies, like in terms of uh, light years or parsecs. And then I was also wondering if you can tell me a little bit about, I just read the abstract of the paper, but you mentioned in the abstract um, that these, most galaxies are not strong C2 emitters and that these were, and so I was wondering if these are somehow special galaxies that they're um, this, you know, this mature um, so early on and that they, that they would have this strong C2 emission as well. So, sorry, can you repeat the second question? Sorry, so the second question is, uh, you noted in your abstract of the, the Nature paper um, that there are strong C2 yeah. emitters and that most galaxies are not at, the, at these redshifts. Um, so I was wondering if there's somehow special galaxies. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, answer your, so your first question is uh, the resolution, so it's a, a few hundred, a few thousand light years. Um, and then um, your question about, are these special? So indeed, um, we see that these galaxies form slightly more stars than other galaxies at the same epoch, um, and they're slightly brighter in C+. Um, and we think both of these things, um, th they tell a similar story as what the, the rotating motion tells us, is that these must somehow be more evolved than other galaxies. So maybe they formed in a higher overdensity in the very early universe. They started, you know, they formed earlier. Um, so yeah, it, it, there's a consistency. The, also the colors, what we see in Hubble Space Telescope, um, all points to these galaxies being slight outliers. But what we really need to do is uh, do these types of observations on a larger sample of galaxies and determine if these are truly different from the others. Okay, next question. Okay, we have one behind you, Larry. So Steve Marin, uh, freelance. Jay, do you have, uh, Lock, Dr. Lockman, is there any uh, estimate of a time scale for the presumed motion of these hydrogen clouds away from the plane? Well. Oh, this is on, good. Yeah, our model is fit, uh, the data are fit with the uniform velocities, and so just the, the uh, ones that are closest to the galactic plane are presumably younger and have been less uh, involved with the wind. But that's where the 10 million year comes from. We see these up to a kiloparsec and a half at away, and it just takes 10 million years to get there if you're ejected from the center. Larry, you have your own. A related question for Jay. Do you have any plans to look, say, at higher latitudes to see whether you can tell when these melt into the background. Yeah, we've got to. We've just got to. And the deadline for proposals is 1st of February, and I'm writing it right now. You better leave. <laughs> okay, take one over here. I had a question for Jay, too. Um, could you tell us what the uh, kinetic energy of the uh, mass outflow is? Uh, yeah, it's. Um, five times 10 to the 39th ergs per second over 10 million years. And so that ends up being um, 10 to the 54, something like that, a few 10 to the 54 total kinetic energy in the clouds. And that's well within the range of what supernova over that time scale can supply, yeah. It's a few hundred supernova, isn't it? Sorry, what? It's a few hundred supernova, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, any other questions here? Oh, down here in front with Ethan. Uh, this question is for, oh, sorry. I'm Ethan Siegel from Starts With a Bang in Forbes, and this is a question for Dr. Smith. I would like to know, um, it seems really unusual, or unexpected at least, that you would have something other than turbulent motions of gas in these galaxies, um, because you'd expect with the with the infall, with the rapid star formation, and with the supernovae that follow, that they would get all mixed up. Do you have a working theory, or an idea, or even a stab in the dark at how 
how these got to be in a nice, smoothly rotating plane already. Um, so we, we do have looked at a number of um, models and simulations. Um, now, the simulations vary greatly, but there are some simulations who do predict this or do, do show that at least the most massive galaxies at this epoch uh, do form nice rotating disks. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll need to see, uh, you know, whether these simulations are correct with more observations, obviously, but um, I think there, some of the uh, assumptions they must have taken about um, how the gas cools and how the supernova, how they implement the supernova, um, that might be correct in this case. Our, our uh, observations might tell this. So it is not, we don't need extraordinary physics to, to explain it. it. It can be done with, you know, simple, we start with a dark matter halo, gas falls in, and it simply starts to rotate as it falls in. So similar to just the standard old Zeldovich pancake theory? <laughs> yeah, it can be, yeah, yeah. It just, it depends how you implement your supernova feedback and how strong that is and, um, you know, and how many galaxies in the end we'll see that have this kind of rotating motion, yeah. Carrie, do we have any online? Okay. This, uh, this question is also for Dr. Smith. Nancy Atkinson from Seeger asks, did the rotation of the galaxies provide information on what shape the galaxies were, spiral, elliptical, et cetera? Uh, so, um, Compared to, um, say, the Milky Way that has very nice uh, spiral patterns, um, y usually kind of spiral patterns need more time um, before they um, develop. So these galaxies look very similar to galaxies, say, three billion years after the Big Bang, which is the, uh, the peak of star formation in the universe. Um, and so these are likely turbulent disks, so they're much smaller. Um, and there's a lot of turbulent motion, but the rotation is the dominant, the dominant motion in the galaxy. So it's a little bit like the Milky Way, but more, uh, you know, more turbulent. No more? Okay. Any other questions here in the room? Well, I have a few myself. Uh, I'll go in order. So my first question is for Dennis Bodowitz. Uh, what are the future prospects for uh, remeasuring the period of, or this the rotation period of this comet. I mean, I assume that at the current apparition, it's too far away now, but it's going to come back. Or what, do you have any options to to see if your predictions are right about how much more slow it will be going? Um, we've we've been awarded Hubble time to to look at it now. Um, right now, it's it's going behind the sun, mm -hmm. so so it and and indeed it's very faint. Um, a problem with with slow rotation is that it becomes increasingly hard to measure it. Um, if you're looking for a small variation of, of a tenth or, or, or two tenths of a magnitude over a over hundred days, that is a rather challenging measurement to do. So what, what I hope for is that the comet comes back in a completely different rotation, again, a very different rotation period, maybe a wobbling, irregular shape. Um, what we're very interested in is to see if other comets do, do the same sort of behavior or not. Um, and as I one of the, the difficulties in that is that you have to have a comet that you can see for an extended time. And our next best candidate is Comet Wurtenen, which is coming close to Earth in December of this year. So um, you should all follow that comet closely. Uh, it was the original target of the Rosetta mission. Um, it's, it's, it's often been on people's wish list as a, as a mission target. And, and that comet is, is very similar in its properties to 41P. So that will be a very interesting test for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have a question for Jay. When you first um, showed us the velocities, you described them as, you know, very fast approaching, very fast receding. But the bubbles are, assuming that their, you know, origin is the center of the galaxy, are, are being ejected up and down. So are we looking at, uh, like, a, a broad spray of ejecta, do you think? Or, do you, or is it bubbles that are being ejected up and down and spreading out? Do you have any way of knowing? Yeah, it appears to be a broad spray. Uh, the central parts of the cone have, would have a very low velocity projected to us and would be lost in foreground emission. So to some extent, we can only see the extreme velocities. But from that, we infer that there's a smooth distribution throughout the cones, and it's not just at the edges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, for Chris, can you uh, describe some of the other applications that you see for this kind of uh, visualization technology? 
the Galactic Center is an obvious one because we can, you know, it's easy to imagine being there and watching things go around, but, uh, you know, what other kinds of uh, astrophysical scenarios do you envision applying this technology to? So the, the main thing I found is, um, like, when you're looking at the 360 video, you can see about 90 degrees by 90 degrees at once. So as long as you have any type of uh, uh, simulation or uh, data set where you have significant variation on that scale, I, I think it would, it would look quite, quite cool in that fashion. Um, the other thing I also work on is uh, just binary systems. So there, over 180 degrees, you have a nice change, but you can only, you can only see a subset of, at once. Um, so you just need to find something, um, uh, some simulation that, that on a 90 degree scale, it, it, it varies quite significantly. So like if you go to the, um, um, like the, the Millennium simulation or, or uh, cosmological simulations. Since then, I think that would be, um, that would be quite interesting. Um, or if you have any kind of, uh, uh, or that movie um, that was uh, shown about the galaxy formation, that would be a, a nice one. Just as, as long as it looks uh, varying on that, on that somewhat small scale, then it, it looks good. Otherwise, it's kind of a, it's a somewhat of a letdown when you spend all that time making the movie and you think it looks cool and it's, and it's not. Okay, and my, my final question uh, for Renska, um, you showed uh, you know, a schematic spectrum with a carbon line, an ionized carbon line, and um, I, I always like to find out how you convince yourself that, that you know what line that is when you don't have a nice pattern of lines, you know, and you have different wavelengths that you can say this looks like it's coming from carbon or from hydrogen or from something. So, because if you, you could say, it's a particular line at one redshift or a different line at a different redshift if you don't know for sure, right? No. Um, so in the, in the submillimeter, there's not that many lines um, that could be that bright. So we didn't have that many uh, alternative options, mm -hmm. but we really needed uh, the imaging from the uh, Hubble and the space, uh, Spitzer Space Telescope to distinguish between, to, to completely rule out any other uh, options for any other redshifts or other distances. And you have that data already or you're going to be getting it? Um, no, so um, the, the, the Hubble, so we used the Hubble and Spitzer imaging to identify the candidates that we then followed up with ALMA. Okay. So, um, you know, we, they already had very good constraints, which is why we picked them. So yeah, we would so know that if we just so you got, got the one redshift line, already. You yeah. had, had the redshift already. Okay. Um, but there have been some observations by different groups since this paper came out um, that seem to tentatively sort of for sigma ish um, confirm some fainter lines with optical telescope and carbon three line. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. That, Double, double ionized carbon line. So um, there's now even good, more evidence. Good confidence, yeah. yeah. Okay, any other questions here in the room? Oh, we'll have one down here in the front. Wait for the mic. I have a loud voice. No, the problem is that they won't pick it up on the microphone and the webcast. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Morgan Allen, I'm freelance. Uh, I have a question for, actually two questions for Jay Lockman. Uh, in order to relate this to uh, students who uh, are not as well versed in these arts, do you have a range of values, say, for what the gas density might be in the Fermi bubbles, uh, say, a number of atoms per unit of volume? And uh, what would be a range of, say, the mean free paths of, of those atoms? Uh, for this is, These are for the students who will be as gray as I am in 50 years. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I'm not sure about the density in the bubbles, but it has to be less than a thousandth per cubic centimeter. It's really very, very tenuous. And I'm not even sure how accurate that number is. Um, people argued about the existence of these for a number of years because it's so hard to pick up the emission from the bubble gas itself against the background. But I will be able to get you uh, precise numbers about that. Yeah. Do you really think people who aren't well versed in these arts are gonna be asking about the mean free path? That gives me an opportunity to introduce them to just curious. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, good, we have another one on the webcast. All right, this question is for Dennis. This is from Rick Lovett, freelance. At DPS, this was described as a potentially repeating cycle with the comet reversing rotations and then cracking again and slowing down cyclically. Is that idea still on the table? Um, absolutely. Um, so, so when a comet slows down and, and you can start changing its, its rotation, um, uh, the, the outcome can be 
rather random, um, and it's going to depend also on where active areas are on the surface and on the shape of the nucleus. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 may, it may have been a completely different rotation. Um, it, may, it may, and that was one of the questions that we also raised. This is now a rebel phase that this comet goes through at, at, at a period of trouble, or, and how long will it, will it take before it settles down in a stable rotation along one of the, the, the rotation axes, which is what we think that most comets do. Is that it for the web? Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, then we'll call it a wrap for this afternoon. Um, I want to thank the speakers again. Uh, thank you, Paul Hertz, especially for joining us at uh, a late hour. Uh, and we uh, look forward to two more press conferences tomorrow. Uh, there won't be any on Friday, just so you know that. Uh, the one in the morning, 1015, it's uh, all about what you can do with space telescopes. Uh, you got a nice hint of what you can do with uh, something like SWIFT. We're going to see some results from uh, Hubble Space Telescope and other space telescopes tomorrow morning. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you all once again for your attendance and we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow.